struggles that culminate into what we call the black experience. If you're black, especially if you're a black American, there's certain aspects of your life that are known universally. But the one thing that's always remained unknown is our history. So with all these things being true, this raises the even bigger question, why and how? If the people of the transatlantic slave trade were Hebrew, how would they be in Africa? And why would they be there? Isn't Israel in Israel? Isn't Israel white? In other words, where's the proof? Growing up in America, we were never taught who we were prior to slavery or even where in the heck in Africa we came from. Remember, Africa is twice the size of America. Saying somebody's from Africa is like saying somebody's from Earth. I mean, school made it seem like some Brits were sitting around like, hey, hey, you know what would be dope? If we had our own country, B. What? Yeah, bro. I mean, a bro tired in the mug, poke tripping, and the cane? I mean, your boy get out of pocket with them taxes, bro. I mean, really. So they sailed to America and was like, work sucks. So they sailed to Africa. They met some traders and he was like, hey, I heard you the one looking for them slaves. And they was like, yeah. And he was like, hey, bro, I got these slaves over here. They've been slaves for like forever. I mean, like forever, ever. And they was like, forever, ever? He was like, yeah, they ain't even got no history. And then they started randomly going ham all over the continent of Africa, picking up random slaves. The truth is something altogether different. Actually, there was absolutely nothing random about the transatlantic slave trade. The trade was in specific areas of Africa that involved specific peoples. Slave owners and traders even went to Africa requesting specific tribes. Now something should raise a few eyebrows when you conquer a land full of natives who you could enslave, who not only know the land but know also how to cultivate it, but you don't. But you'll rather risk your life traveling the Middle Passage, one of the most dangerous stretches of water to navigate in the world, to bring a specific people to be slaves who you claim to be lazy savages who know nothing cannot read or write and have zero knowledge about the agriculture of that land. Seems kind of counterproductive, don't you think? See, all the images concerning our ancestors that were put in front of us in America were of a people destitute of everything, even down to their clothes, who have no worth, no skill, and no understanding. Akin to the zip coon black sambo iconography of the past, a people that had no other purpose but for entertainment and to be the literal butt of every joke of their masters. The truth is that the stereotype was constructed and crafted carefully. It was a type of social engineering to keep the black mind from hitting the reset button and returning back to its former glory. In the year 65 BC, the Roman armies under General Pompey captured Jerusalem. In 70 AD, General Vespasian and his son Titus put an end to the Jewish state. During the period from Pompey to Julius, it has been estimated that over one million Jews fled into Africa, fleeing from the Roman persecution and slavery. The black Jews had an advantage over the African tribes 
They carried their culture, history, laws, and written records with them. This assured them a constant precedent for the development of a higher social organization. Because of the stability of the black Jewish culture, the Jews were not absorbed into the indigenous population. In fact, the Jews absorbed some of the native tribes. The Jews made use of every opportunity. They were industrious and skillful people. In the Jewish Ghanaian states were found kings, princes, governors, generals, secretary, treasurers, revenue agents, judges, architects, engineers, doctors, historians, language interpreters, mathematicians, jewelers, sculptors, masons, carpenters, painters of art, goldsmiths, leather workers, potters, armorers, saddlers, blacksmiths, and agriculturalists. From Babylon to Timbuktu by Dr. Rudolph R. Windsor. Just think about it. Did the slaves go to college? When did they learn how to build homes? When they couldn't read nor write? But they can build the White House? And invent the cotton gin in their spare time? Remember, it was Lewis Howard Latimer, a freed slave who invented the light bulb, not Thomas Edison. Elijah McCoy was the son of a runaway slave who somehow found the time to own over 57 patents on the steam engine. Benjamin Banneker, the son of a free slave, was a farmer, mathematician, and astronomer who designed the layout of the city of D.C. While in his spare time, reverse engineered the pocket watch and could recreate a more accurate version out of wood. Are you freaking kidding me? Just one generation away from slavery? But I thought we were uneducated savages. This is why the race to the new world consisted of two races. The race for free land and the race for free labor. But not just any land and not just any labor, but the empire builders of West Africa. This is why they put up those posters of Zip Coon and Kangfish. You know something, Dazzle? Hold us here cruising around through the easel waves over the waterfalls and the snow clad mountains. And over the great American desert, that may be all right for them on horses. But did you remember when we was in the African Navy? <laughs> Boy, that was something, wasn't it? Was we a couple of admirals then, or was we a couple of admirals? Oh, boy, then that, that show was the happy time. Huh? Oh, I was, we was back there now again, y'all, sir. Boy, if we only had that old battle wagon again, we could show step out and take Zululand, couldn't we? Oh, What if they knew? At one time, in Iberia and Africa, before the Muslim conquest, the world knew them as Israel and Judah. And the history of the tribes speak to it. For then, I will turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of Yahuwah to serve him with one consent. For beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers, my scattered people, will bring my offerings. The greatest love story ever told. When I started to research and visit Hebrew tribes in Africa, I truly started to learn the undying love Yahuwah has for his people. I also started to learn that Yahuwah wanted to reconcile Yehuda and Ephraim, his two sticks, so that we could fully show his glory. What we don't realize is that no transatlantic slave ships docked from Israel. So how were Hebrews taken from Africa in the slave trade? If we do not examine the migrations of Hebrews further into Africa from Israel, then we lose a great link in reclaiming our heritage. One, we must understand that Israel was physically connected to Africa until the Suez Canal was completed in 1869. The Suez Canal was man-made for war and commerce. War in the Middle East. Israeli forces drive spearheads across the Sinai Peninsula, west to the Suez Canal, south to the entrance of the Gulf of Aqaba, breaking the blockade, capturing the west bank of the Jordan River and occupying the old city of Jerusalem. So Israel was physically severed from Africa for war and the love of mammon. 
it should be noted that the tectonic plates of Israel and Africa are still connected because what Yahuwah brought together, no man can put asunder. According to the late Dr. Thomas Oden, the author of the African Memory of Mark and founder for the center of early African Christianity, Africa was always a haven for Judah. Scholars call this the reverse exodus. The first exodus was from Egypt to Israel. And the second exodus was, was whenever the Hebrews fled from Israel further into Africa. Now, what we must understand is that Hebrews did not travel from Israel to places like Ghana, Nigeria, Togo, Congo, South Africa, Kenya, and Benin in one day or one year but they migrated to these places over generations. Hebrews migrated to Africa for many reasons. Sometimes it was because of the destructions of the temple, war, Greco-Roman domination, Islamic conquest, and even to trade on the Silk Road. Yah's word prophesied that we would be scattered to the four corners, and that scattering did happen. When you look at how many times Africa is mentioned in the Bible, we see that Ethiopia was mentioned 45 times in the scriptures. Add this to the 500 references to Egypt in the scriptures, and we discover that Africa is mentioned more than any other landmass in the Bible except for Israel itself. And remember, originally Israel was physically connected to Africa. A great deal has occurred since the scriptures were written and a great deal has been distorted and covered up to deceive the whole world as we're told in Revelation 12, 9. Now it is up to us to have eyes to see and ears to hear what Yahuwah is saying in this hour. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers, even my scattered people shall bring my offering. The river that runs through Cush, or Ethiopia, is the Nile River. And the word beyond in this text is the word Eber in Hebrew, which means the opposite side of. So this text translates as the other side of the Nile River of Ethiopia, all my scattered people. Where exactly is that? Negro land, West, Central, and South Africa, the home of the Bantu people. So is it a coincidence that the Bantu people who live beyond the river of Ethiopia were scattered and then captured and sold as slaves in every nation? For behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people, for my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. They have gambled for my people and have given a boy for a harlot and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians? So when we're talking about the curses of Israel, there's a few things you need to know before you can go into the curses of Israel. First, you have to understand the scriptures from an ancient perspective. and You have to understand what a covenant is. Now, whenever two nations or two people was going to come together, they would make an agreement and they would make a covenant. They would also have witnesses that will witness to the agreement of the terms and conditions of the covenant. In the covenant, they would set blessings if you abide by it, and they would set curses if you would break the covenant. Not only was they making a covenant with each other, 
but they actually was making a covenant, a covenant with their lineages, their bloodline, their family, everybody that's was within that person. You can actually see this in the scriptures. As when the Most High made a covenant with Adam, he made a covenant not just with him, but everybody that was inside of Adam, his generation. And as you go, you're through the scriptures, you'll see it more with Abraham. He made a covenant with Abraham, not only with that, with Isaac and also with Jacob and to the 12 tribes of Israel. And then when you look into uh, Deuteronomy 29, when the nation of Israel was coming into a covenant with the Most High, Moses was the mediator and Moses said, I am making a covenant with you this day, your tribes, your captains, your children. Not only would you do I make this covenant, but he said with future Israelites that he making a covenant with. So this is how I know that this covenant or the consequences of blessing it passed down to the children. Right. And this is why he says that I visit the iniquities of the father upon the children to what the third and fourth generation of those that hate me. So when you go back to Adam, when Adam messed up in the garden, his consequences affected his lineage. And this is why it's important to understand that the things that we do can affect everybody that's inside of us. This is why he told the Israelites, he said, today I set before you a blessing and a curse. He said, choose life that you and your seed may live. So things that one generation do were passed down to the next generation. So we must understand that because he said these, when you break these covenants, he said these covenants shall be a sign upon you and upon your seed. How long? Forever. So this is why it's important for us that are the children of Israel to understand what happened in ancient times that has passed down to the day so we can see the problems and the circumstances of what we're going through. Because we always have wondered why we hate it. Why were we lynched? Why are these things seem like we can never get above? Why it seems like we the tail? But the, when we, when you search it out, you understand that it's all about a covenant, a covenant that we made with the Most High. He said, I'm going to take a people unto myself. I'm going to give them my laws and my uh, statutes and my commandments so the earth can know my mindset, right? But he said, when I make this covenant with you, he said, if I give you these terms and conditions, if you obey them, I'm going to make you above only and not beneath. But if you disobey them, then the consequences of this covenant would not just be upon you, it'll be upon your children. So now, lo and behold, we see the problem that we have in America, the problem that we have on the four corners. We are under the curses of an ancient covenant that was um, set before time that has passed down all the way to the children, just like we are under the curses that Adam messed up that was passed down unto all of Adam's children. So now we see that these curses, notice how these curses are, are written in the scripture. It said, these curses shall come upon thee. What does that mean? While you're in the land, you have specific curses that are to the land, that your crops were, or was, was not going to come to flourishing, that your king was going to be taken, that you was going to be besieged, right? Then he said, these curses shall, per, shall pursue you. That means anywhere that you go, if you're scattered, these curses is coming to pursue you and do what? overtake you until you be destroyed. So these are the things that we are dealing with. These are the things that have been following our lineage. We wonder why we hate it. We wonder why we are living in a land that get, don't give regards to the old or to the, to the young because of something that was spoken, an oath that was spoken over us before we was even born that now we understand. Man, this, this spot was erected to try to honor those, those lives that was lost and to be a memorial for the things that we, or the things that were lost and destroyed. That way we would never forget that this happened. Um, my entire life going up here, it was alluded to as the Tulsa race riots. Uh, the name has just now been adjusted in the last year to the Tulsa Race Massacre because it was a one-sided affair. The uh, African Americans, Blacks, Hebrews had no, no weapons that they could come against. 
those, the oppressors, those that attack them. So uh, this place is probably, it's what we have. It's not worthy of over 300 bodies, 300 personnel lost their life. Thousands of people were uprooted and became homeless, lost everything they worked for. Uh, generational wealth taken in one day. So, I mean, we're happy to have it, that it is a memorial and we remember what went on, but, um, hey, it's hard to, you know, when you think about it, it's hard to kind of adjust yourself to it and say, yeah this, yeah, this is what happened and we're appreciative that at least something remains that we can uh, have this story, but uh, it, it should be a far greater endeavor. This probably should be a national museum for all the history that took place in this place. Okay. Tell me how this thing, how this place relates to the curses of Deuteronomy 28. Man, you hit me fast, but you're not that happy. Um, curses of Deuteronomy 28 says that uh, we would be the tail and not the head. The tail and not the head. Um, Oftentimes we hear people say, I'm the, I'm, the, I'm the head, I'm not the tail. No. Actions like this ensured that we would always be the borrower. We would never be the lender. It said that the dollar would circulate in this community for three to five years. At first I had heard weeks. And uh, it's a college professor. I believe he's in Michigan that does a course about the Tulsa Race Massacre. And their documents said a dollar could stay in this community for three to five years. Can you imagine how much wealth would be in this community? Um, lynchings, they were literally lynched. Curses of being hung on a tree. Uh, and it, no matter what happens, we get out of slavery and we get to this point and they start to rebuild and gain wealth. But I think it's Deuteronomy 28 and 46, and it says uh, on their seeds, on their seeds. So this is, uh, you can identify their seeds according to this. Um, man, it shows how real and how pinpoint those prophecies are how pinpoint those prophecies are. Um, man, your children. <laughs> you know how many people lost their children? I mean, it's all up and down Deuteronomy 28, 15 through 68. You go through them and just say, man, this applies to us also. It's saddening the amount of destruction because what it did is it wiped out this entire community. Everything. No homes, no businesses. You're talking about we as a people it's listed as two theaters, movie theaters, 30 restaurants, dentists, lawyers' offices, completely gone from, I think, May the 31st to June 1st over a 24 hour period, a whole community destroyed. The people are still here, but everything that they have sold their lives into, gone in a day. And it's not because they did anything. It was because the, I don't know what to call the other groups, the other side of this equation couldn't stand to see a people prosperous. It's oftentimes it's like, get up our generation from my childhood on up. We were told, get up and work for it. Don't be lazy. But we see when our ancestors worked for it, it was destroyed because the inequality in this place, in this captivity, no one wants to see us rise to our full potential. No one wants to see us equal to them. It has to be some way that they can keep us below them. 
in this room, what they have done is, um, man, I want to say in the 80s, um, an effort has always been to try to record this story before all the survivors and the witnesses passed away. So I want to say around the, in the 80s, they started gathering the testimonies of the witnesses and the survivors that saw it happen. People that literally said, I lost my family. We can't find my father. And that's the way we know that it was over 300 um, souls that lost their life. At least 300 from eyewitness testimony. Uh, it's thought to be far above that, anywhere from 1,000 to 300. But in this room, what they have done with the survivors that they could find when this place was being designed and erected, um, they got their stories, they photographed them, and below each of their uh, photographs, they placed their testimony. So it lives as a memorial for the people that actually survived this massacre, lost families, traumatized, probably PTSD for the rest of their lives. And how do you imagine that now we can go back in society? It's nothing on this side of town. So now the same people that did this to us, we must go to the other side of town just to get groceries, just to get go to a diner if we were blessed and fortunate enough to have that type of funds to where we could go do those things, to go get supplies, to run whatever type of uh, building, seeds to grow. I mean, when I was a kid, everyone grew gardens just to get seeds. You have to go to the very people you saw destroy your community just to get your necessities. It is extremely hard to thrive in the land of your oppressors because everything is designed to make sure you never exceed or ascend above your oppressor. Who would let you come in their house and you get to make all the rooms within their home or make all the rooms within their home when we're going to eat dinner what the menu for dinner is going to be it just simply doesn't work like that in life that's why it's such a necessity for everyone to realize what power you have in your land when you're with your community and when you're with your tribe it's on a whole nother level whole nother level um, they used to have a place here where they had a core foam board where someone had made a replica, but they took the topographical map portion of it, placed it over the community so all the streets were in place where you could see it. They set it on far with like, I guess they made some type of wax figures of the uh, structures and the cars, buses. I mean, it was so much here. And then they lit it on far and it burnt it in place onto the board. And it was probably four foot by eight foot. I don't know what happened to it, but it was an amazing replica to see when you just scorch something and you still have the streets, the street names. You These streets are still here. We understand, uh, everyone knows the Gap Band, Uncle Charlie, Greenwood, Archer, and Pine. That's where the name of the band came from. This is Greenwood. It goes up to Archer and Pine is the next street over a mile away. So it's amazing to see those streets listed on a piece of burnt um, artwork that depicted what literally happened in real life here in this place. As you can see, these are the unpaid financial claims and it, it lists that it's 2,719,745.61. But that is equivalent in this day and age of 100 to 50 million dollars. 100 million dollars just up in smoke. Never, that's what it would be the equivalent to today that just disappeared from a community and was never repaid. So that is, again, generational wealth that was just stolen. I mean, we have claims of $77,000 in the 1920s. The only claims that were paid were for the guns and ammunitions that the mob that came down here and, and did this to our people. They 
filed claims on stolen ammunition and stolen weapons and their insurance claims were approved and paid back. But they couldn't pay repay those insurance claims for people who justly spent their life working hard to build what they dreamed, what they envisioned. They spoke it, they, they made it manifest, hard work, it was destroyed and they can't get it back. It's sad. The Oklahoma State University tower that sits on that hill is a fairly new structure. It is reported that machine guns were taken up on that hill during the massacre and shot. It, you can see the whole community from that hill all the way up a mile from Pine, all the way over to Archer, all the way here to Greenwood. So they could shoot literally with machine guns across that entire uh, one mile square block that the massacre took place on. So it's amazing to really think about how um, the military efficiency that's put into that. You know, you take high ground. You go take the high ground and you can fire down on whatever you, you have. Uh, we call it, when I was in the military, we call it the uh, field of view. You know what I mean? So your, your field of view is, is amazing from high ground. But it's, it's, it's horrible. It's horrible. So how? What was going to be his whipping stick? He said, you provoke me to jealousy. We're following other gods. And I'm going to provoke you to jealousy. To put you under a people that was not going to give regard for you. To put you on the people that was going to take you of a, uh, take you to a land with language that you didn't understand, that was going to dominate you. And what nation did he send first? He sent Assyria. Then he sent Babylon. Then he sent Persia. Then he sent the uh, the Greeks, Grecian. Then he sent the Romans all the way to America. But you can really first look at this even in the Book of Judges. Every time they would break the covenant, he would send another nation in, and then they would cry for deliverance, and then he would redeem them. So this is why we was taken to America. This is why we was taken to the four corners of the earth and that we was in captivity. Even our Messiah, Yahushua, who the world known as Jesus, prophesied a captivity outside all the other ones, outside of Assyria, outside of Babylon, outside of Greek, outside of Roman. He said there shall be a nation that's going to come in and lead you into captivity into all nations. Then now we got to look in history after he spoke that what nation was led into captivity in the four corners of the earth. And you have to look at the transatlantic slave trade. See, among these nations, you will have no rest. You will be getting killed from the time that you step foot on this nation. First of all, how you was going to get there. And the scripture says you're going to get there through ships. But even on those ships, from those ships, you was getting killed and thrown overboard. And then all the way to America now, where you're getting killed in the streets, you're getting beat, you're getting burned, uh, you've been lynched, you've been castrated. He said, among these nations, the, psych the psychological curses that'll be upon you, you will have no ease at all. Now, name me a 15 year period since we have been here over 400 years that we have had ease. Through every time period, we have been persecuted. Every time period, we have been killed. Even up to the day in 2020, we still have to declare Black Lives Matter because the same thing that was going on when we first got here is still going on now. We still have chains upon us, letting us know that this is the consequences from an ancient oath that we made that we're dealing with now. Our life shall hang in doubt of the from the time that we have got here, our life was hanging in doubt to the day when you get pulled over by the police. Your life is hanging in doubt. You don't know whether to reach for your or reach for your license, whether to reach for your registration, because everything that we have tried to do to comply, we have been killed for. Eric Garner, uh, Trayvon Martin, George Floyd, all these different aspects of things that we have been tried to do, our life will hang in doubt, not even just with oppressors, but even with ourselves and our own neighborhoods, walking through our own neighborhoods. What? Because of the curses, like the 
scriptures say? Oppression makes a wise man mad. It was a point in time throughout our history that we was wise people, but oppression has made us killers of our brothers, murderers of our sisters, where our life hanging down of us, even in our own neighborhoods. We are getting in international terrorism through other nations and then domestic terrorism within our own neighborhoods. The scriptures is speaking for itself. Our life is hanging in doubt of us. See, the scripture said that we shall betroth a wife and another man shall live. Can you imagine marrying a woman and a slave owner owns her that treats her like his property? So even on your wedding night, he comes in and takes his property, have sex and rape her like the scripture said, and you were having no might or no power in your hand to do it. He put his imprint on her. But that was spoken of in ancient times that this would happen, that the most I was just saying, if you just keep my covenant, I will keep you from these things. He's saying that you will plant a vineyard and you would not gather the grapes that was foreign to our people. Because every vineyard in ancient times that we, we planted, we gathered the grapes. It was for our people. But to plant a vineyard, cotton, tobacco, sugar cane, all these things where big businesses and the wealth of America was built off this thing, was we received nothing for it. So this is what the scripture was explaining. These are the curses that we ain't just pulling out of nowhere. This stuff is real that you can see that's supposed to get your attention and ask why is these things happening. And it'll return you to the same book that you've been rejecting. Your, your identity, even the curses of your identity. The scripture says that you would discontinue from your heritage. What's in your heritage? Your language, your customs, your culture. All these things that said you would discontinue from. You'll be a people wondering who you are where your your identity and nationality is changing every every two years first you black then you colored then you afro-american then you african-american what's going to be in the, our next nationality in the next years but the scriptures prophesied that we wouldn't know that because we broke an oath that was passed down to our lineages our sons and our daughters was given to another people and we see what happened in history. All we got to do is look in history and see that the Bible is revealing itself. The scriptures is revealing what happened. That we was put on auction blocks. That children that we birthed were sent to other nations for us to never to see them again. Was given to another people. All the way to the day is still happening where our sons is being uh, uh, given to another people. It's getting, being in prison and all these things are happening just as the book proclaimed that it would happen. Are these not the curses of what Deuteronomy 28 and what the scripture spoke of? Are we not seeing this in reality all the way up to 2020? How can you deny what you're reading? But the scripture said that we'll have eyes that we wouldn't see and ears that we wouldn't hear. That it'll be right in your face and you still can't see it. It'll be the words be put to your ear and you still won't have no resolve in it. Look how specific the scriptures are. It said, I was sin faintness of heart and a sound of a shaking leap. Do you know that that's speaking of our path to freedom? That's speaking of the Underground Railroad where you would be sleep and a sound of a, look how specific the scripture is saying, that the sound of a shaking leaf will have you to tremble when nothing is pursuing you. What is happening? A fox or something will come out the woods. We sitting there trying to get the freedom, waiting, hiding out, and then a, and it'll be faintness in our heart when these things happen. Look how specific these curses is to let the people of the covenant know that you broke a covenant and you have an Elohim that's pursuing you. This is your route back to the ancient paths, to your ancient God, the people that didn't know who their God was, didn't know who their culture was, didn't know who their religion was. Another curse is that you will uh, follow gods that either neither you or your fathers have known. Who are the people in the earth that in one household, the father can be a Buddhist, the mama can be a Christian, the son can be an atheist, and the daughter can be whatever new religion she want to come up with? All in the one household, specifically do the only people on earth that don't follow the God of their culture because we don't know who the God of our culture is. The scriptures speak of a yoke of iron and being up. Just go back and look at when we was led into captivity, when we was led to America, 
when we was led to other uh, places we've been sold, we had a yoke of iron around our neck. You have to be able to look in history and uh, line it up. One of the things that was specific to us is we was walking around with yokes of iron around our, our necks being what led into captivity to where just as Yahushua or who the world known as Jesus prophesied into all nations with a yoke and iron until we be destroyed. The scripture says that we will be scattered into the four corners. When you look at the sub-Saharan uh, slave trade, when you look at the transatlantic slave trade, we were sent. You will find us on every continent in the earth, from that standpoint that we were scattered to. The Scripture spoke of those things, that we would be scattered into the four corners, until the the name of us be taken, the remembrance of us be taken off the earth. We didn't remember who we were. Are people in the earth that had no name, had no authority. The name of Israel was taken away from us. The remembrance of all the great things that we done and it was replaced with what? That we were somewhere in Africa, swinging on trees, running from lions and running from alligators, that they became our savior for bringing us here. And now they made our memory be only what? Slavery. And then made us in their school systems elevate and celebrate our oppressors made holidays after our oppressors and made us learn the knowledge of this and tell us the only worthiness that we have is what is slavery that's how far our history go back in every year of black history because what it said it would take the what the remembrance of our name from the earth Thou shalt become an astonishment, a byword. What is that? What's some of our bywords? Nigger, coon, jigaboo, lazy, sorry, black. All these type of things are bywords that are known among us and it keep changing. The scripture talks about how we'll serve our enemies in the want of all things. Now, from an ancient perspective, when you study ancient Israel, it was foreign for us to go to other nation for basic needs like clothing, uh, food, uh, uh, material and different things like that. Those things that we produce on our own because we were self-sufficient. This is why the Most High even gave us a clothing law and how we are to conduct business with each other. But when you, the, the curse would be this, yet we would have to go to places like Walmart, places like Kmart, places like uh, uh, Kroger and um, Bilo and all for the want of all things rather than producing this stuff ourselves. We would grow our, have our own cattle, grow our own food, make our own clothes. All these things we were self-sufficient. But the curse would be that you would go to your oppressors for all of these things. And then the scripture says that the stranger, now listen to this one, that the stranger that is among thee shall get up high above thee and he shall lend to you and you shall not lend to him. Now, all you got to do is just sit there and think about that. The stranger, who would be the stranger in our neighborhoods? The Chinese, the Arabs, the Europeans, that they will come to our neighborhoods and what lend to us and get up above us. They will come. We've been here for years and uh, uh, the Mexicans and the Chinese will come here and build businesses and build these things and bring it in our neighborhood and lend to us. The Arabs own the, 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 the hotels and the gas stations and all these type of stuff to get there and they will do what? They will be in our neighborhoods lending to us. The scriptures even talk about what we know today as black on black crime. That it talks about the brother that was tender among you, that your eye would come evil towards each other. It talks about also in Isaiah um, 51 that speaks of that your children, your sons would, um, would have fainted. And the scriptures talks about they would seem like they would be unconscious, that they would be at the head of all the streets as a bull calling to the net. Now, how could the, the scripture speak of a people and identifying us? We know ain't no little Jewish boy sitting at the head at the corner of all the streets. Unconscious, mad, like a bull calling the net. That's how it says that we would be. 
Like we aren't afraid to come through some of our own neighborhoods because our young men are on the corner of the street as a wild bull called in the net. They are angry. They are ready to kill. They are ready to shoot each other. The scriptures speak of that. And they also speak of, speak of fatherless homes. It says that women will rule over you and the children would be the oppressors. The children right now are the oppressor. They are the ones that's killing, that's selling the drugs, that's doing these things in the neighborhood and don't have fathers in their home. And then it said that you are people, are people that will be robbed, the people that would be spoiled, are people that would be in prison houses. Look at what the scripture is speaking of. Who is it identifying? It said these curses will be upon you and your seed as a signpost. As evidence to who you are who, who look and see who are in the prisons In the land of our captivities You got to look and say Who was in the land of the captivity That said that they would be spoiled That say that they would be in prison houses It identifies us You go look in the prison houses And see who is there You go look at our homes And see that the fathers are not there That the women have to rule over And the children are our oppressors You got to see who's on the street corners like a wild bull calling to the net. Who else is it identifying? The most I was specific with these curses because when we would break them, he wanted us to see who our God was, who we had to turn to. So this is why the understanding of what slavery is is more uh, important just than getting mad. But it drives you back to your constitution. It drives you back to your God. That will bring you repentance and that can redeem you back to where you're supposed to be in the right place in the covenant. The scripture talks about how we'll be slain before our enemies in the street. We look at Trayvon Martin, Eric Gardner. We look at uh, the most recent case, George Floyd. We look at all... Um, and those are just the cases that are known is many, 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 many more cases than that That is out there That the scripture talks about That we'll be slain before our enemies You look at all the hundred years of lynching And of Jim Crow When we were slain before our enemies And they would uh, uh, pack out um, parks And bring children to, be, to see a black man or black woman hung And then burned and then we'll cut their limbs off as souvenirs. This is what we was dealing with, that you'll be slain before your enemies. And then it says they that rule over you, those that hate you will rule over you. That means that you will have to go to their judicial system to get justice and they hate you. And they will make the rulings over you. And then the scripture speaks up that you will be punished seven more times for your sin. This is why a European and a, a, a black man or Israelite can commit the same crime. But we would be punished seven more times. We would get longer sentences. We would get harsher punishment. It ain't just the system punishing us, but it's the breaking of the covenant that was spoken of before time that we're dealing with. And our uh, disposition or our uh, reasoning is supposed to be, why is this happening? Why is this happening to us? That would lead us back to who we are as a people. All right, so you might ask, I understand the curses of Israel, but what did this have to do with the Messiah? What did this have to do with um who the scriptures calls Yahushua, who the world called Jesus. Now you may wonder and say that I'm redeemed from the curse of the law. Ain't no curse upon me. But you still understand that you have the curses of Adam upon your lineage. Women are still having pain when they have babies. Men are still working by the sweat of their brow. It will come a time that we will, we, right now we have been sealed, but we will be redeemed from these curses where sin will be no more. But what did Yahushua say? He said, you'll be led into captivity into all nations. But how does this relate to us? Remember, when they asked, who do you want? Barabbas or Yahushua? They said, give us Barabbas. And they said, let his blood be upon us. They should have left it right there. But they said, let his blood be upon us 
and our lineage, our children, future generations. That what gave us what the curse of innocent blood that were passed down where the sword wouldn't leave our house. So how did it materialize upon us? Just as he was hung on a tree, we was hung on trees. Just as he was beat with 40 stripes, that was the minimum of stripes that we got beat with when we would mess up. Just as he was sold by his brothers, a soul by his disciple. We were sold by our brothers into captivity. So were the Bantus scattered? Or were the Bantus sold to Grecians? In other words, Europeans? Let's think about this. See, these facts are not lost in history but actually substantiated. European and Islamic explorers, even slave traders, heavily documented this truth. Even Tudor Parfit, a modern day historian, discovered the following pattern when researching the first-hand accounts of European travelers in West Africa in the 15, 16, 17, even 1800s. They wrote in his book, Black Jews in Africa and in the Americas. Ethnographers, Missionaries, colonial civil servants, and travelers time and time again maintain that African tribes, including the Kosa, Masai, Yoruba, Shauna, Igbo, Zulu, Hottentot, Tutsis, Ashantis, and many more practiced Hebrew customs spoke partially Hebrew languages and were of Hebrew biological origin of the seed of Abraham. This is one of the developments that has fed to the creation of a worldwide phenomenon of black Judaism. Or like in William Armistead's 1848 book, A Tribute to a Negro. Quote, a remarkable fact in the history of Luango in the empires of Congo is that the country According to a statement that was fully credited by Oldenthorpe himself, a writer of most correct judgment and unimpeachable veracity, contains that Jews settled in it, who retained their religious rights and distinct habits, which kept themselves isolated from other nations. Though thus separate from the African population, they are black and resemble the other Negroes in every respect to physical character. It is possibly an allusion to this case that Pennington in 1827 wrote in his textbooks saying the descendants of a colony of Jews originally from Judea settled on the coast of Africa are black. Maurice Fishberg in his 1911 book, The Jews, A Study of Race and Environment, wrote that, quote, it is stated that the Falashas or Ethiopian Jews are not the only Jews of the Negro race. Bastian speaks of the Negro Jews living in the Luongo coast of Western Africa. They are called Mavambu or Judeos. They are on the whole a fair looking race, says Bastian. They are more serious and restrained than the rest of the Negroes. Although in other places, they are despised. Here they take a dominating position or at least such as to be respected and partially even feared because they are rich and have most of the commerce in their hands. The same author claims that though they're of a Negro race, still he detected Semitic facial features in their phenotypes. Even in Madagascar, a traveler had discovered Jews. Sibri mentions that the Afimbo on the east coast of that island he met who called themselves Zafi Ibrahim or descendants of Abraham who claim to be altogether Jews, but I cannot detect any difference in the color. Hmm, remember Billy the Jew in Charleston, who was from Madagascar, who said he's from a tribe of Rechabites? Just saying. Malt Conrad in the 1700s wrote in his book, Universal Geography or the Description of All Parts of the World, that quote, 
A fact worthy of attention of the travelers is that, according to Odenthorpe, in the kingdom of Luango contains black Jews, scattered throughout the country. They are despised by the Negroes, who do not even design to eat with them. They are occupied in trade and keep the Sabbath so strictly that they do not even converse on that day. They have a separate burying ground, very far from their habitation. The tombs are constructed with masonry and ornamented with Hebrew inscriptions. The singularity of which excites the laughter of the Negroes, who discern in only serpents like lizards or the reptiles. Notice the reoccurring theme of the Congo in these quotes from Europeans. See, the kingdom of Congo is joined at the hip with Hebrew tradition, custom, and language, which at one point was widely known amongst European and Arab explorers, missionaries, cartographers, etc. For example, the Luba people, one of the least documented but largest areas in the Congo at one point was the Luba Empire or Luba Land. The Luba have a tribe amongst the people called the Baluba. After visiting and researching the Luba on its quest for the lost tribes, famed British historian and author Dr. Tudor Parfit had this to say about them in his book, The Jews of Ethiopia. Quote, Northward of Katanga lives one of the greatest tribes of Central Africa, the Baluba, who are of undoubted Semitic origin. Hold up, let me say that again. Who are of undoubted Semitic origin. The name Baluba means lost tribe, and their language and their customs have many Hebrew affinities. Their name for an idea of God, their word for water, and people, in many other words, and ideas show their Semitic strain. Well, let's see if we can find out where he got that from. Let's look at a few Hebrew words and compare it with the Baluba Chaluba dialect and see if they line up. Abba in Hebrew, meaning father, and Chaluba, Abe. Yah, the name of the God of the Bible. Yah. And Jaluba. Bet, meaning house or people. Betu, and Jaluba. Toda, meaning thanks in Hebrew. Tanda, and Jaluba. Matthew, or in Hebrew, Mati Yahu. And Jaluba, Matea. Jacob, which is Yaakov in Hebrew. Yakuba and Chiloba. Sarah in Hebrew, which is Sarai, and Chiloba, Salah. Catmiel in Hebrew, Kadima and Chiloba. John, which is Yehukanan in Hebrew, and Chiloba, Yokana. Malachi. In Hebrew, in Chaluba, Maleki. Noah, which is Noak, in Hebrew, in Chaluba, Noka. Karath, in Hebrew, which means to cut. In Chaluba, Kata. Cain, in Hebrew, in Chaluba, Kaina. Amos, in Hebrew, Mosi, in Jaluba, Moses, or Moshe, in Hebrew, Masa, or Mosa, in Jaluba, Mayim, meaning water, in Hebrew, Mai, in Jaluba, Samuel, in Hebrew, in Samsule, in Chaluba, Shem, in Hebrew, in Simo, in Chaluba, Yob, or Job, in Hebrew, Yoba, in Chaluba, Zechariah, in Chaluba, Zikaya, Shiloh, in Hebrew, 
Shilo in Chiluba, Eli in Hebrew, Ele in Chiluba, Shabbat in Hebrew, Samba in Chiluba. Shabbat is the Sabbath or the day of worship that's on the seventh day. And Samba in Chiluba means seven in prayer. Not only does the Chaluba dialect have an ancient Hebrew origin, but also the word Chaluba itself. First Chronicles 2, verse 3 and 9. The sons of Yehuda, Ur, Onan, Shelah, which three were born unto him of the daughter of Shua the Canaanitess. And Ur, the firstborn of Yehuda, was evil in the sight of Yehuda, and he slew him. Verse 9. The sons of Hezron that were born unto him, Uramil, Ram, and Chalubai. Chalubai. Yes, the term is actually listed in the Bible. Even Kalanu, a white Jewish organization whose sole purpose is the reuniting of scattered Jewish communities, recognizes the Baluba in a statement which they wrote. Quote, according to Kabukia, one of the leaders of the Jewish community, the members of the Luba are the Jews of the Congo. Though it's the largest tribe and millions of the Luba people are aware of their Jewish roots. Most feel disconnected and fearful of diving into their own heritage. The religious environment here in the Congo is not very open to anything other than Christianity. And so they feel trapped. Even the word Bakongo goes back to Hebrew origins. The word ba is bar or ben in Hebrew, meaning son. And the word congo in Hebrew is the word kagor, which means girl or girdled. So the term ba congo means the girdled sons. Exodus 29, 5 through 6. And thou shalt take the garments and put upon Aaron the coat and the rope of the ephod and the ephod and the breastplate and gird him with a curious girdle of the ephod. And thou shalt put the mitri upon his head and put the holy crown upon the mitri. What is a mitri, you ask? Well, it's a turban. This scripture points back to the Levitical priesthood. Now let's take an even closer look at the word kagor. Kagor. Pronunciation. Kagor. K-H-A-G-O-R-E. A belt for the waist. Apron, armor, girdle. Why is this important? Well, when you trace back the ethnogeographic origin of that word, it gets really interesting. Let's do a quick search on forebears.com for nationality and country of origin for the word Kagor. Where does the last name Kagor come from? The last name Kagor is more frequently found in Zimbabwe than any other country or territory. The last name Kagor occurs mostly in Africa, where 98% of Kagor live, 61% in Southern Africa. The last name Kagor is most commonly held in Zimbabwe. Well, there is actually a tribe in the Congo who came from Zimbabwe called the Limba. They've been heavily documented as not only quote unquote Jews but as priests even the World Jewish Congress stated quote members of the priestly clan of the Limba the Buba which is one of the 12 clans have a genetic element also found among the Jewish priestly line known as Kohenim or priests some believe that the word Limba comes from the Bantu word Limbi meaning non-African or respected foreigner other things it comes from the word Chalimba which is a Swahili word for turban, Mitri, that was worn. Why is that important? Now let's rewind back. Exodus 29, 5 through 6. And thou shalt take the garments and put upon Aaron the coat and the robe of the ephod and the ephod and the breastplate and gird him with a curious girdle of the ephod. And thou shalt put the Mitri or turban upon his head and put the holy crown upon the turban. Remember, Bakongo comes from the word Ba and Kagor, meaning girdled sons. 
tore the main parts of the priestly uniform was the curious girdle and the holy turban or Mitri Mitri H4701 Miss Naf turban of the high priest of a king or a high priest diadem Mitri so the girdle sons also were a holy Mitri or turban the only article left to wear what the priest would wear would be the FR and breastplate something like you see in this photo of an Ashanti priest wearing this photo was scribed by a European on their expeditions to Ghana see even when you take a look of the cultural practices and attire of the Hebrew women the true practices and attire found in the scriptures you might find a whole revelation There are many cultural parallels between biblical culture and African culture, from the daily lives to the important rituals marking the life events for women. We could start with physical appearance as well as clothing and adornment. In Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 5, it reads, I am black but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Clothing. In... Isaiah 3, 16, the scripture reads, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty, walking with heads held high, and wanting eyes prancing and skipping as they go, jingling the bracelets on their ankles. False. So let's take a closer look at this passage and get an even clearer picture of the culture of Israelite women. Isaiah states in Isaiah 3, 16, that the Israelite women walk with stretched out necks, mincing, and making a tinkling with their feet. So what exactly is mincing? A synonym for the word mince is to sashay or to strut. Now, the black woman, because of a naturally curvy figure, is the most synonymous woman on earth with this type of walk or strut. But he doesn't stop there. He continues and says that they make a tinkling with their feet the word for tinkling is the word akat, meaning to shake bangles, rattle, tinkle anklets. Even the Gesenis Hebrew child lexicon states to adorn oneself with anklets or to make a noise or the tinkling with them a mark of a woman desirous of attracting attention. The ankle bracelets and the bangles are a part of East and West African tradition. For example, the Wolof women of Senegal wear anklets to determine marital and social status. The women of the Ivory Coast wear them during initiatory rites, funerals, or festivals. In some rites, the anklets are used to create music during a ritual dance. In other words, as Isaiah said, they make a tinkling with their feet. Isaiah continues in verses 19 and 20 and speaks about how the Israelite women also wore chains, bonnets, earrings, and leg ornaments. Waist well, chains are worn by tribes all over Africa. For instance, the Yoruba woman is the prime example who fits the Isaiah 3 Israelite woman description to a T. The Yoruba women wear bonnets, earrings, and anklets. And in the Yoruba culture, Unmarried women of the tribe wearing alike, also known as waist beads or waist chains. Even Ghanaian girls might be presented with waist beads as a token of their coming of age into womanhood. The waist chains were so integral that they have different colors representing different meanings. In verse 18, Yahuwah states that he will take away the tinkling anklets and what the KJV translates as calls and round tires like the moon. What exactly is that? Well, the word call is the Hebrew word shabiak, which means interweaving. Interweaving. Again, the Hebrew lexicon states that calls are networks use of the head ornaments by Hebrew women 
little signs or studs resembling signs worn about the neck. The phrase round tires like the moon is the word Saharan, meaning an ornament around the neck, a round tire like the moon. So calls and round tires like the moon translate as round interweavings worn about the neck that resemble tires and the sun and moon. The Maasai people of Kenya and Tanzania wear round interweavings around the neck that resemble tires and the sun and the moon. I mean, really, you can't make this stuff up. The scripture speaks for themselves. The Western world has told you this is what an Israelite woman looks like. When in actuality, according to the scriptures, this is what an Israelite woman looks like. Verse 20 also speaks about the Israelites wearing of headbands and tablets. Headbands and tablets. What culture on the earth wears headbands and tablets? Well, that will be Ghana. Well, women and men wear headbands or mitris in their traditional attire. Also, some of the elders of Ghana wear tablets as a sign of their tribal position or authority. Maybe this is the origin of the Jewish tefillim or phylactery, a box containing parchment of scriptures that were worn on the forehead. And right before we let you get back to your regularly scheduled program, by the way, there was a curse attached to the scripture because of disobedience. In verses 17 and 24, Isaiah prophesied that there will be a time when Israelite women will be cursed with hair loss particularly the crown of the head. Quote, Yahuwah will smite with the scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion. And, quote, instead of well-set hair, baldness. According to dermatologist Crystal Og, who specializes in hair loss, nearly 50% of black women experience some type of hair loss. From the decades of perms and heat damage, and processing of their natural hair. Now, when you put all these facts together, it paints a very Afrocentric picture of the daughters of Zion, far from the images that's been presented through westernized lenses. Carry on. Jingling the bracelets on their ankles. In Ezekiel 16, 12, I also put a ring in your nostril, earrings in your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. We can see that there were many ornaments worn by the daughters of Zion, and we see similar ornaments worn by the women on the continent of Africa. In West Africa, Central Africa, South Africa, we see the wearing of anklets, headbands, scarves, necklaces, bracelets, earrings, nose rings, jewelry served as an ornament to beautify and also in some cases as a protective guard against evil spirits. The Nindeble women of Zimbabwe beautify themselves by stretching their necks with tight rings of brass called Zilla. Didn't we just speak about the scripture where it talks about the daughters of Zion walking with stretched out necks? The Berbers of Northern Africa wear silver ornaments to protect themselves from illness and evil spirits. Along the Ivory Coast in West Africa, where gold is plentiful, women wear large gold jewelry. It's the same in Central and South Africa. Another important ritual for women is that of Nida. In Leviticus we read, if a woman have an issue and her issue in her flesh be blood, she shall be put apart seven days and whosoever toucheth her shall be unclean until the even. As I said before, this is in the book of Leviticus, which is written to the Hebrew people, dealing with a woman with an issue of blood. Because of the issue of blood, she is put apart seven days. The word translated here as put apart and separation is the Hebrew word nida, which comes from the root word nadad, which means to retreat, to flee, 
depart to drive or chase away. These verses are referring to a time of a woman's ministerial flow. These are laws in the scriptures that govern a woman and her function during this time. This is her monthly retreat, her separation, her nida. There are also laws to govern childbirth in scripture. This law is found in Leviticus 12, 1 through 8. To paraphrase, after a woman gives birth to a child, she is separated for so many days depending on if she's had a male child or a female child. This period of separation is also called Nida. These laws were intended to be passed from generation to generation, and they have. Scattered throughout the continent of Africa, we find practical societal traditions that seem to fit with the biblical text. In many tribes, during menstruation and postpartum, women don't participate in cooking and preparing food, household chores, or collecting water. Women aren't permitted to enter a sacred place or participate in religious service. In some cases, she and her husband don't even share the same living quarters. Also, absolutely no marital relations is allowed. In Leviticus 20 and 18, we read, if a man has sexual relations with a woman during her menstrual period, both of them must be cut off from the community, for together they have exposed the source of her flow. This separation is thought to be a time of purification for the woman. Here are a few examples. The Hebrews of Cameroon. During menstruation, a woman is separated for eight days. Intercourse is forbidden. After menstruation, she is purified and can participate in normal activities. The Sefwi of Ghana also practice menstrual purity laws found in scripture. There are marked similarities in cultural rituals that mark life events in the, in the Bible. Uh, traditional things such as um, how one gets married in Nigeria, Ghana, Cameroon, Kenya. The similarities would be things ranging in requesting a bridal price. We find this in Exodus 22, 16 through 17. The fact that a groom's father presents payment. This is found in Matthew 22, 1 through 14. The knocking ceremony. This is done by the Kikoyu. This is done by the Igbo. This is found in Matthew 25, 10, and also Revelations 3, 20. The knocking ceremony speaks volumes of the Hebraic roots of West and Central Africans. For example, the Ghanaian wedding traditions are more or less similar to those of the Kenyan tribes. First, the groom goes to the family of the bride's house to offer an engagement, along with witnesses and family. It almost starts with a knock at the bride's house. This is where the groom announces the wedding intentions to the bride's parents. During the Kokoko, or the knocking ceremony, a spokesman from the groom's family Usually the father offers a drink to the bride's family. And if it's accepted, the visitors can now state the intentions of their visit to marry the bride. And upon drinking of the cup by both parties, the engagement is sealed. Now, let's compare the Coca-Cola or the knocking ceremony with the scriptures of the Bible. Revelation 3 verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and I will sup with him and he with me. Mark 10 verse 39. And he said unto him, We can. And who should say unto them, You shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of and with the immersion that I'm immersed with. With all you shall be immersed. These passages refer to the Coca-Cola. The knocking ceremony. The Bible states that Yahushua, the Messiah, is the groom, and his people are referred to as his bride. Year long engagement, or what is known as a betrothal, this is considered legally binding. Having the son return home to prepare a dwelling before taking his bride to his home, which would likely be on his father's land. Having a wedding feast that lasts many days. And here's one that's especially clever, discovering a bride. This is a practice that's done by many tribes on the continent, and it involves the, the groom uh, having to fill the arm of several different young women to discern which one is his bride. 
This is said to have been done because of the trickery that was played on Jacob from Laban in giving him Leah instead of Rachel on his wedding day. The Igbo tribe implement the drinking of a shared cup of wine between families to seal the acceptance of the bridal price by the bride's family. This is a covenant, much like the covenant spoken of in scriptures that were sealed by the eating of bread and drinking of wine. There's also a similar concept of the Leverite marriage that exists in West African culture in that a woman is considered married to the whole family and is referred to as a wife of the family name. If her husband dies, the family will seek to remarry her within the deceased husband's family. An example in scripture would be the story of Tamar, who eventually bore children from her father-in-law. Another way that biblical culture, uh, that West African culture mirrors biblical culture is in childbirth and infant care the use of birthing stools and delivery. We can see this in Exodus 1.16. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you serve as a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him, but if it is a daughter, she shall live. Ezekiel 16.4. As for your birth on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut nor were you washed with water for cleansing. You were not rubbed with salt or even wrapped in cloths. This is the Yahuwah himself speaking of the rituals that should occur after the birth of a baby. There should be a cleaning of the baby and a swaddling of the baby. This is done in West African culture in just about any tribe you can name. Uh, Luke 2, 7 reads, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. There are several rituals uh, surrounding birth, the cutting of the umbilical cord, the washing with water, rubbing with salt, being clothed by attendants, being named by parents, and circumcision of the infant boys on the eighth day after birth. Speaking of naming, the Ashanti tribe of Ghana um, the mother will remain inside for eight days, after which she and the child will come out and the child is named. Naming a child on the eighth day is also a Hebrew tradition. And we see this in Luke 1, 59 through 60, where it says, And it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they called him Zacharias after the name of his father. And his mother answered and said, Not so, but he shall be called John. These evidences are not only in the Congo and West Africa, but all over the continent. But when speaking about Hebrews, slavery in West Africa, there are few more telling connections than the slave coast in Negro land, which today is called Oida, which the white Portuguese slavers call Wida, Wida, or Judah. As you see on this map from the 1700s, the slave coast was listed as the Kingdom of Judah by the slave traders. I could speak on what they said about the inhabitants of Weta, but I'd rather let them speak for themselves. This quote is from Press and Bulletin Magazine language document from the Society of Geography. Weta, Fida, Huida, Uida, Judah or Judah is a ancient city frequented since the 16th century by Portuguese slave traders who gave it its name. Its inhabitants were said to be Judaic and were viewed as a remnant of the scattered tribes of Israel. See, this kingdom of Judah was in the territory of Benin, where an ethnic group exists called the Gadangwe. The Gadangwe is actually two different tribes, the Ga and the Dangwe. You might just recognize these two tribes if you're familiar with your Bible. The, the Hebrew names Gad and Dan. On page 24 of the August number of the Ghanaian magazine, in the column, it occurs to me, Kwesi Bonso writes that the people have been wondering about the close cultural similarities between the Hamoo festival of the Ga people and the biblical celebration of the Feast of the Jews as outlined in the scriptures. 
And in September 1961, in the issue of the Ghanaian, E.A. Ama, an authority on Ghana history, language, and customs, discussed the parallels of the Ga Homowo and the Jewish Passover celebrations. These parallels included similarities in calendars, prayers, protective rituals, and festival harvest meals. The basis of the Ga religion is enshrined in their three great annual feasts, namely Homowo, Nayamale, and Namutu, which have a very close and intimate parallel connection with those of the Jews. Or as one aptly put it, are reminiscent of the three annual festivals of the Jews, namely the Feast of Passover and Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Ingathering. The God people, like the Hebrews, begin their year in March to April, according to the moon. The year is lunar. The computation in each case starts with the visibility of the new moon. Some old God names of the month are Adani, Abasani, Eluni, Baluni. Why is that important? Because the Hebrew names are Adar, Abib, Elul, and Bul. Hence, Adani, Adar, Abasani, Abib, Eluni, Elul, Bolani, Bul. Even the months are parallel which in English are from March, April, September, and November. One remarkable element which gives meaning and value supporting the Egyptian-Palestinian origin of the Homowo is the Akpade rate, the blood smearing ceremony, similar to the blood on the doorposts of Passover. Certain ceremonies precede the Homowo celebration about one or two days. One of them is the Gebezi, the clearing of the road for the passage of Okai Koi. This takes place on Friday afternoon. Here, Okai Koi is substituted for the Lord or the destroying angel of the Passover. In the afternoon, the lentil and the two side posts of the door in every house are besmeared with akpade or red earth. And in the evening, a gun is fired and the announcement is made that no one should go outside of the door of his house into the morning. This is expressed in the guy as Ole Azi Kapoi. The belief is that there are good and bad spirits who guard the destiny of different aspects of the creation. The opinion is held that there may be some of the evil spirits among the pilgrims that come to the city. God Mashi, Thursday, Osu, Mungunu, Monday, to take part of the celebration of the feast. It is therefore held that the Akpare rite is intended to expel or repel all that is bad and evil from every house. This is the purpose of the Akpare ritual protection. The blood smeared on the doorpost. Late in the night of the Homo'o Eve, the Gamansi, the God traditional king, kills a sheep, aka the Passover lamb, and the flesh is shared to responsible elders to be cooked on the festive day, Saturday. Early Saturday, the women in every home begin to cook the festive meal known as kapekpe, the poke poi, or ko, which is the unleavened bread, eating with psalm soup. Be it noted that a koro, or bitter herb, is spread over ko, or kapekpe, which is reddened by mixture with the red palm oil. Here, it's important to note that in the time of the Messiah, the Passover was eaten with bitter herbs and unleavened bread cakes. Preparation for the feast takes place and a lamb to be slain is bought. The pilgrims come to the main towns. Parents give their children gifts. Daughter-in-law presents mother-in-law with logs as a mark of respect, not only between wife and husband, but more particularly between two extended families. E.A. Ama, Annual Festival of the God People. During the Homowo Festival, if you're in attendance, you might just hear a song that they sing there called Wujo Joki. We come from afar. Which sounds a little like this. <laughs> As beautiful a song as it is, 
It's actually a history lesson in which the guy tell you the story of their migration to Ghana from Israel. Don't believe me? Well, let's take another listen. <laughs> See? Well, let's take just one more look at the lyrics of this song. But this time, let's remix it and give it a little more juice.
Even the ethno-linguistic group that a guy belonged to is called the Akan people. Why is that important? Akan is the name of the son of Carmi, the son of Judah, an Israelite, who in the book of Joshua was the source of the Israelites' failure to conquer Jericho. Then there is the Ashanti, also a member of the Akan. Ashan was the name of one of the towns in Judah. Ashanti, meaning the people of Ashan. The Ivory Coast is an Akan member as well. Well, the Ivory Coast was called at one time Cote d'Ivry. Ivry is the Greek phonetic spelling of the Hebrew word Eber, meaning Hebrew. Therefore, the coast was actually called the Hebrew coast, Cote d'Ivry. Okay, well, let's say that we need a little more proof because it's actually called the Ivory Coast, right? You know, like elephant tusks. I get it. That's what they're really known for, right? Well, eventually, Ivory was pronounced Ivory. See, even the origin of the English word Ivory comes from the Latin word Eber. Eber? Get it? Plain enough? Well, let's cap it with this. See, the same territory was also known by another name. Gofo di Judeu. This quote is from the Royal Geographical Society with the British Institute of British Geographers. Verse 16. Gofo du Judeu. The Jews Bay. The Gulf of the Jews. Castillo got it by Pimento identifies it with Kalango Bay and this I accept although the Gulf of du Judeu of Bahamines globe seems to represent Luango Bay seems to represent Luango Bay Gulf of du Judeu the Gulf of the Jews so the coast of the Hebrews was also known as the coast of the Jews hmm See, amongst the Hebrews, excuse me, the Ivorians, or another ethnic group, do you remember the Ga people? We spoke about that came to West Africa with the Dangwe people, Gad and Dan. Well, amongst the Ivorians are the Yakuba people. Remember, the Israelites are the sons of the patriarch Jacob, who Yah or God changed his name to Israel, but his birth name was Jacob which in ancient Hebrew is pronounced Yakub or Yakob. The Yakuba people are also known by another name, Dan. Exodus 1, 1 through 4. Now these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt. Every man and his household came with Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Ishakar, Zebulon, Benjamin, Dan and Natali, Gad and Asher. Now, at this point, if you still have a question whether or not the Israelites are black or African, let's go to the Encyclopedia Britannica. Dan, a African people. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me repeat that. Dan, a African people. Dan, also called Geo or Yakuba. A ethno-linguistic group of people inhabiting the mountainous West Central Cote d'Ivoire and adjacent areas of Liberia. The Dan belong to the southern branch of the Mende linguistic subgroup of the Niger Congo language family. They originated somewhere to the west or northwest of their present lands, perhaps among the Menlinke. The Dan are closely related to the Gur also spelled Niger or Gwer, to the south. Another Akan connection with the tribe of Gad is the Igbo people of Nigeria. The following quote is from ShavaIsrael.org, a European Jewish organization whose goal is to reunite lost Jewish tribes. Quote, the Igbo Jews of Nigeria who call themselves B'nai Israel are a part of a larger Igbo ethnic group. Most of the Igbo Jews live in an area which straddles the river Niger near the Ambara states. 
The Igbo Jews are said to have migrated from Syria, Portugal, and Libya to West Africa around 740 CE. It is claimed that the initial immigrants were from the biblical tribes of Gad, Asher, Dan, and Naphtali. Later, they were joined by more Jewish immigrants from Portugal and Libya in 1484 and 1667, respectively. Some of the Igbo Jews claimed that the river Sambadion, beyond which the lost 10 tribes were dispersed by the Assyrians, is in Africa. Now, in this quote, it says that the Igbos claim that the river Sabadion is in Africa. Were they the ones who claimed this? Is this true? Well, let's take a look. But first, I know you're asking the question. What the heck is the river Sabadion and what significance does it have? Well, this river is connected to a writing in the Jewish Talmud, the holy book of European Jewry which speaks of the location to which the lost 10 tribes went after they were taken into slavery by the Assyrians. So let's see what was written. Sanhedrin 94a, the Gemara asks, where did Sennacherib exile the 10 tribes? Marzuthra says, he exiled them to Africa. And Rabbi Hania says, to the Salug Mountains. So this wasn't a narrative that the Igbo stated. This actually was written and recorded in the holy writings of Jewish sages over the centuries. Also, how would the Igbo even know about that information without access to the Talmud? So if they knew this was in the Jewish writings, why are they painting the narrative that the connection with Africa the river Sabadion and the 10 tribes was something that the Igbos proposed out of thin air. Then there's even the famous Ashkenazi rabbi, Rashi, Rabbi Shlomo Yasaki. And one of his many commentaries on the Talmud added, quote, the 10 tribes went to one place, Africa. Then again, there's a letter of Rabbi Elijah ben Salman Zalman, also known as Vilna Gaon. One of the most familiar and influential names in rabbinic study since the Middle Ages, who wrote on the subject stating the following, quote, a letter sent by the elders and rabbis of the Ashkenazi community in the land of Israel to Ben Moshe and the ten tribes, written and presented by the great sage, knowledgeable in the hidden and revealed, the great light, our teacher, Israel, author of the book, to Ken Hatton, the appointed head and leader of the Ashkenazi community, known as the Midrash Perusum, in the city of Zaf. May it speedily be rebuilt in our days. Amen. Thus, send the dwellers of the land of Israel who abide by the Torah of Moses, which is a gift and an inherited portion, to our brothers, the children of Israel, the sons of Isaac, the sons of Abraham, who revealed the belief in Hashem. They are our holy and pure brothers, the righteous upon whom the world rests. Then Benai Moshe, the servant of Hashem, who dwells across the river Shabbaton, also known as Sabbatian, also known as Sabbatian, and who pledge allegiance to the king, the king of Israel, who sits upon a mighty throne and who rules over the ten tribes whose settlement is in the land beyond the rivers of Nubia, who count according to their banners, the tribe of Dan, of Naphtali, of Gad and Asher. The tribe of Dan, of Naphtali, of Gad and Asher. The tribe of Ishakar, who understand the movements of the celestial bodies, constantly involved in Torah study, and the tribe of Zebulon, encamped at Mount Friar. So were the Igbos making up claims of Israelite heritage? Or was the Ashkenazi community aware of the Igbos' Israelite heritage for centuries? 
This might be why Professor Dr. Alfred Bodenheimer, Professor of Jewish Literature and Religious History at the University of Basel, who received a traditional Jewish education and conducted Talmud studies at Yeshiva University in New York and at Yeshivat Hamavadar in Israel, stated, quote, British rabbis were already aware in the 1840s that there might be descendants of the ten tribes in the Niger Delta. That is, even before the process of Jewish acceptance of better Israel or the Ethiopian Jews began. Evidently, though, the Ebus, who today number 20 or 30 million people, would be political and demographic dynamite. Given the sheer number of potential Jews of Nigeria, it is no accident that Israeli authorities are hesitant to act even as non-Orthodox rabbis from the U.S. are undertaking full-scale missionary tours among them. The Igbos even have a similar migration route narrative as the Ga people of Ghana. According to Shavai Israel, it went as follows. Quote, the Arabian Peninsula, Egypt, Ethiopia, Kenya and the Sudan through the trade and travel of North African Jews within the West African kingdoms of Mali, Songhai, and Karambanu. According to the accounts from explorers of the region, several of the rulers of the Songhai Empire were said to be of Jewish origin, though the Jews traveling with Kael Tamashik, Torag, trade caravans, came from various parts of Northeast Africa into West Africa. A 9th century Hebrew traveler named Eldad ben Mali, also known as Eldad the Danite, said that his tribe Dan migrated from the land of Israel as to not take part in the civil war at the time of Jeroboam's secession and were residing in the land of Havilah beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. According to Eldad, Three other tribes in addition to Dan, Natali, Gad, and Asher, as mentioned above, were with them. These had joined in the times of Sennacherib. Eldad wrote that the evil Jews in Africa had an entire body of scriptures, except for the book of Esther and Lamentations. They knew nothing of the Mishnah nor of the Talmud, but they had a Talmud of their own in which all the laws were cited in the name of the biblical Joshua. So let's look at this. Eldad the Danite said that the Ebos not only did not know the Talmud, but they didn't even own a copy of one. But they did have their own written Torah scrolls, AKA the books of the Old Testament. So with that being true, how would the Ebos even know about the Jews being scattered to the river Sabbatia, a writing that's not even found in the entire 66 books of the Bible, Old and New Testament, a writing that only exists among the rabbinical writings of European Jewish sages, writings that the Ebos didn't possess nor had access to. The journey from the river Sabbatia to West Africa was not religious fantasy, but the oral tradition of their history. A fact confirmed even by their Ashkenazi counterparts. This is further proof that the European Jews have known of the location of the bloodline descendants of Israel for centuries. The Ebos also claim to descend from a single Hebrew ancestor named Eri, the son of Gad. Historical accounts of the link between the Ebos and the Israelites state that Eri from Israel was the fifth son of Gad, one of the twelve sons of Jacob, Genesis 46, 16, and the sons of Gad, Zaphon, Haggai, Shuni, Asbon, Eri, Arodi, and Areli. Shortly after the exodus from Egypt, many centuries ago, Eri and a company of his brothers, Areli and Arodi, with the families, migrated to West Africa, traveling by water. They finally arrived at the confluence of Ezu 
and Amabala rivers in the present day Aguilari and Ambara state. Where according to old tradition, it was spiritually or divinely revealed to Eri to be their final destination and settlement. Eri the Patriarch's home became memorialized and known as Abu Gad or the House of Gad and is still standing in Nigeria to this day. This quote is from Letters Descriptive of the Travels Through West and South Barbary and Across the Mountains of Atlas by James Gray Jackson, page 187. Yehudi, a place of great trade. This place is reported to be inhabited by one of the lost tribes of Israel, possibly an immigration from the tribe of Judah, Yehuda, and African Arabic signifies Judah. Yehudi signifies Jew. It is not impossible that many of the lost tribes of Israel may be found dispersed in the interior regions of Africa. When we shall become better acquainted with the continent, it is certain that some of the nations that possess the country eastward of Palestine, when the Israelites were a favorite nation, have immigrated to Africa. See, the slave coast is not the only area in Africa with connections to the Hebrews, nor is it the only place we see connections to the term Judah or Yehuda. See, the area stretching from west to east, from Eviland to Abyssinia, was called by Arab cartographers Saudin, pronounced Soudan. That eventually was shortened to Sudan, the current name of the country that lies on the eastern side of the continent. See, you don't have to look far to find the meaning of the word Soudan or Soudan. So, Strong's H5471, concealed or hidden. Yudan, Strong's H3063, Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel. Hence, so you done means the hidden or concealed ones of Judah. Need further proof that you done comes from the word Judah? Well, this quote is from the Monarch Principal Studies in Jewish Self-Government in Antiquity. Epstein, relying on the parallel in Palestinian Talmud Sanhedrin 1, 18d, which attributes the report on Gamal to Rabbi you done suggests that we have two alternative tannic traditions we'll take a look at the index of rabbinic authorities in the book the talmud of the land of israel volume 3 demai you done variant of judah fourth century ce this is probably why you have quotes from renowned muslim cartographers and historians like al drisi and ibn khaldun in the 12th and 13th century who wrote extensively about Jewish Negroes in the Western Sudan or Joseph Dupuis the vice council of the British government in Morocco between 1811 and 1842 who wrote the Jews of the Sudan are according to my informers divided into many large and small tribes whose names they are unacquainted their mode of life in some countries is pastoral, but the towns are filled with traders and artificers of that faith who gain the substance at their server and always in the service of Muslims under whose government they live as vassals. Dr. Ellen H. Godby, professor of Old Testament studies at Duke University, in 1930 wrote this in his book, Lost Tribes of Myth, suggesting towards rewriting Hebrew history. In the interior of Dahomey, a thousand miles southeast of San Gambia, is a large Jewish community. The Jewish scholar Dr. Kreppel reports their principal laws are engraved on plaster tablets fastened around the temple walls. They have a Pentateuch written on parchment in Hebrew letters, but they have no other books. There is no course nor education in Hebrew for the membership. Under such conditions, that Judaism is a matter of oral traditions. They cling to the Sabbath and to certain Jewish custom, despite the influence of pagan surroundings. There is a high priest with many priestly families whose membership goes about giving moral and religious instruction 
to families of the communities. And again, the scholarly American Presbyterian missionary, Dr. J. Layton Wilson, wrote in 1855 that the religion of Senegambia is a complete medley of paganism, Judaism, and Mohammedism. And it's difficult to say which of these occupies the most preeminent place. The prevailing philosophy is that by combining the three, they are sure to secure the aggregate good of the whole. In Northern Guinea, paganism, Judaism, and some imperfect traces of a corrupted form of Christianity. In the former region of the country, Judaism is more prominently developed. Some of the leading features of which are circumcision, division of tribes into separate families, and very frequently into the number 12, between families too nearly related, bloody sacrifices with the sprinkling of blood upon the altar and doorpost, the formal and ceremonial observances of new moons, a specified time of mourning for their dead, during which they will wear sold and tattered clothes, demoniacal possessions, purifications, and various other usages, probably of Jewish origin, probably of Jewish origin, probably of Jewish origin. Although natives of Africa retain these outward rites and ceremonies with the utmost tenacity, they have little or no knowledge of their origin or the particular object which they are intended to commemorate. Many of them are performed to shield themselves from some threatened evil or to secure some coveted good. So historians agree that in certain areas of Western Africa, the blacks were Jewish, lived in Jewish communities with their own written Torah scrolls and also Torah written on plaster tablets similar to the ones of Moshe or Moses, written on their temple walls. In other places, where they didn't have a written Torah or a temple, they were keeping the traditions of circumcision on the eighth day, separating in tribal families of twelve, blood sacrifices, priests sprinkling the blood on the altars and of the doorposts, the observance of new moons, set apart times of the morning of the dead, rending and tearing their clothes during time of mourning, casting out demons and ritual purifications. Well, if something walks like a duck, talks like a duck, it might just be a duck, especially when it looks like a duck. The problem comes in when you've been told your whole life that a black duck is really a swan. So how did the historical narrative of the image of the Hebrew change? Even the famous Roman historian Tacticus who lived before the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, spoke this about the diaspora. Quote, The Jews were told, escaping the island of Crete, when Saturn was driven from his throne by the violence of Jupiter, settled in the extreme parts of Libya. Speaking of Africa and the Hebrews, when theologians read books like Obadiah, which speak of the judgment of Esau or Edom, you know, Israel, formerly known as Jacob's evil twin brother and adversary, things get very, very vague, especially as to their current location. Some pastors even go as far as to propose that their descendants don't even exist anymore. And that's a pretty wild statement, seeing the majority of Obadiah's prophecies are about their role in the end times. How can they have a role in the end times and don't exist in them? That being said, Jeremiah 49.10 does state that Esau's bloodline or seed is spoiled, meaning that he has mixed his genealogy with multiple ethnic groups, including some of the Ottoman Turk people, some of the House of Saud, even with some of the Europeans of the Russian steppes. And in some cases, effectively being whited out. But let's remember, Esau is Jacob's twin. According to the text, the things as far as looks that separate Esau from Jacob was his hue and his hair. Genesis 25, 25. And the first came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. So Esau was red. Or was he? That word red is admony, 
which means reddish, which is reddish brown. How do we know this? Well, Amoni is the same root as Adama, meaning soil, which is also where we get the word Adam, meaning reddish soil, reddish brown, or red earth. Remember, Adam was made from the earth or the soil. Get it? This word Amoni is also translated as ready, which was used to describe King David. But somehow, when you Google the word ready, you get white people with red hair and freckles. But when you Google ready animals, you get reddish brown, the same color as red soil or red earth. Adama, just like the scripture says, like David and Esau. And also just like a certain people in Somaliland, Meet some of the pure blood line descendants of Esau, known as the Esau tribe. Yes, they still carry the name. Esau in the far language is pronounced Esa. The Esa people are Admoni, reddish brown. And among the Esa tribe, they have ones that are called Asi Mara or red men or red people. According to the old tradition, the red man designation was derived from the color of the reddish soil of inland deserts. Just like how the Hebrews got Admoni or Adama, red, from the reddish soil the Adam was taken from. The Esau or pastoralists as the patriarch Esau. They are patrilocal in lineage like the Hebrews. They practice circumcision of the male as a rite of passage as spoken in Leviticus. In the Issa tribe marriage custom, a male is encouraged to marry his first cousin. You know, like Isaac married Rebekah, his first cousin, who birthed Jacob and Esau. Their homeland is a desolate desert, as prophesied by Malachi. Malachi 1.3, and I hated Esau. And I laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the desert. The Issa came down from the Danakil Desert near the Red Sea, one of the hottest, most desolate locations on the planet. So much so that some call it the gateway to hell. The Issa are known for their violence towards the Israelite descent tribes of East Africa, i.e. the Bantus, also as prophesied in Obadiah. Obadiah 110 For thy violence against thy brother Jacob Shame shall cover thee And thou shalt be cut off forever The Issa tribe also captured the Israelite Bantus of East Africa And sold them into the sub-Saharan slave trade to the Ottoman Arabs As prophesied by Obadiah Obadiah 1, 11 through 12 In the day that thou stoodest on the other side In the day that strangers carried away his forces and foreigners enter into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem. Even thou was one of them. But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger. Neither should I have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither should thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. So the mystery is over. We found Esau, and it just so happens that he's black. Well, ready to be more specific. But I don't think the Issa tribe is any secret, because when we read all these quotes from scholar after scholar, professor after professor, it seems the color of the Hebrews was common knowledge. For instance, Zodafin Bible Dictionary, the definition of ready, ready, a word used to refer to a red or fair complexion and contrast to the dark skin of the Hebrew Israelites. Hold up. Wasn't David and Esau Hebrews? Why would it also say fair complexion? This statement is both an admission and a contradiction. If all these things are true, why are all the images of biblical characters Europeans? Shouldn't there be some more images of black Israelites somewhere on something, right? Let's start with some ancient images of slaves in Egypt. 
and let's see what they look like. What this image is is a statue of a young Semitic or Hebrew slave. As you can see, they were African people. This historical statue of a black Israelite slave in Egypt is actually showcased in the Heck Museum of the University of Haifa in Israel. You can't get more ironic than that. But for the unsure, let's look at images that were made by people who were alive and interacted with the ancient Israelites. What you are seeing right now are images of the Lakish relief, a wall stele made of the capture of the tribe of Judah in the Judean town of Lakish by the Assyrians. This relief was made in 701 BCE by the Assyrians who took them into slavery. As you see, the Israelites had dreadlocks, corn rolls, nappy beards, full lips and noses. They were undoubtedly black. Now, let's go back to Tacticus from his book, The Histories. Quote, many again say that the Jews were a race of Ethiopian origin who in the time of King Cephas were driven by fear and hatred of their neighbors to seek a new dwelling place. Maybe the confusion of the black Jew versus white Jew might not go back to race at all, but rather definition. See, the word Jew, which is short for Judah from the Hebrew Yehuda, was not a word that was used in describing the Yahudim or the descendants of the people of the tribe of Judah across the board until the 15 and 1600s. Mainly because the words Jew and Judaism are not Hebrew at all, but rather English. A language that didn't exist until the 5th century. Moreover, the letter J is only 500 years old. That being said, the term Jew, when introduced, had a different connotation than Yehuda. This is one of the Jewish almanac states. Strictly speaking, it's incorrect to call the ancient Israelite a Jew or to call a contemporary Jew a Israelite or a Hebrew. In the chapter Identity Crisis, compiled and edited by Richard Siegel and Carl Raines. New York, New York, Bantam Books, 1980. This fact is confirmed by several other Jewish sources, such as the Jewish Encyclopedia in 1905 or the Universal Jewish Encyclopedia in 1941 the Encyclopedia Judaica in 1971, the New Standard Jewish Encyclopedia in 1977. How can this be so? Well, this goes back to what is called the Khazar Hypothesis. The hypothesis that draws on some medieval sources, such as the Khazar Correspondence, according to which, at some point in the 8th to the 9th centuries, the ruling elites of the Khazars, a Euro-Turkic people from the Russian steppes, was said by Spanish Yahudim, Yehuda Haliva and Abraham Ibn Daoud, to have converted to rabbinic Judaism and began to identify themselves as Jews. In the late 19th century, Ernest Renan, a Semitic scholar and expert in Semitic languages and civilizations, along with several other scholars speculated that the Ashkenazi Jews of Europe originated among the Turkic refugees who had migrated from the collapsed Khazarian cognate westward into Europe and exchanged their native Khazar language for Yiddish while continuing to practice Judaism. This is why later Jewish geneticist Dr. Aaron Elhite in his study in 2012 concluded, European Jews derived from the Caucasus and Mesopotamian population and that the evidence for a Jewish genome is lacking. Or why Israeli linguist Paul Wexler, who concluded in his two books, The Non-Jewish Origins of the Sephardic Jews and The Ashkenazic Jews, a Slavic Turkic people in search for a Jewish identity, that the Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jews were descendants of Iranic, Turkic, Slavic, and Berber converts. Then there is Professor Martin Richards, of the Archaeogeneticist Group of the University of Huddersfield who concluded that Ashkenazi DNA stands from Europe and not Israel. 
This conversion of Europeans to rabbinic Judaism was witnessed by who? The Spanish Yahudim. According to the historical records, it was Yehuda Halevi and Abraham Aben Daoud, which is interesting. Remember, the Igbo said that they migrated to Africa from Syria and Portugal. The Yahudim of Spain were numerous in Portugal. Portugal is Spain's neighboring country. The Yahudim of Spain were all even exiled to Portugal at one point. But remember, strictly speaking, it's incorrect to call an ancient Israelite a Jew or a contemporary Jew a Israelite or a Hebrew. That's why we have to make a distinction between the Yahudim and the Jews. Because at one point, all Israelites, or ones who claim to be Israelites, began to be classified as Jews. But it just so happened that the Yahudim went from being called Yahudi to a Jew to another word, Negro. So let's see if we can clear up the confusion. The term Jew during the expulsions of the Jews from Europe all of a sudden became a political and religious term versus Yehuda or Yahudi, which carries a ethnic connotation. This is why James Gray Jackson wrote in his book about the Western Sudan, travel south of the Barbary, quote, Yehudi, a great place of trade. This place is reported to be inhabited by one of the lost tribes of Israel, possibly an immigration from the tribe of Judah. Yehuda in African Arabic signifies Judah. Yehudi signifies Jew. It is certain that some of the nations that possess the country eastward of Palestine, when the Israelites were a favored nation, have immigrated to Africa. So with all these facts being presented about the Jews being African, then the obvious question is raised. What about Jesus, right? If the Jews are black, then wouldn't Jesus be black also? Well, let's take a quick look at the Messiah of the Bible. It doesn't matter which depiction that mainstream Christianism presents, whether it's the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Fabio Jesus, or the Syrian-Palestinian Jesus, or the Turkic Greg Caviezel Jesus. All these are diversions to the truth that's clearly documented. See, before the advent of the European rebranding of the Messiah and the Israelites, the ancient world knew the color of the seed of Abraham. It was common knowledge. For instance, historian Flavius Josephus. When you're talking about Josephus, you're talking about what Americans love, an eyewitness account. So let's get his take on the phenotype of the Messiah at that time. Also, there appeared a man of a certain magic power. If it be meet to call him a man, who certain Greeks call a son of God, but his disciples call him the true prophet. He was a man of simple appearance, mature age, black skin, black skin, black skinned, short growth three cubits tall with a long face and long nose eyebrows meeting above the nose with curly hair but having a line in the middle of the head after the fashion of the Nazarenes with an undeveloped beard Flavius Josephus on the image of the Messiah just like how the term Jew is new because the letter J didn't exist 2,000 years ago. Heck, not even 600 years ago. There was never a Messiah in Judea named Jesus. The name of the Messiah is Yahusha, Yahuwah's salvation. Yod He Ua He Yahuwah, found 6,823 times in the Hebrew text, meaning the existing one from the Hebrew root word which means he who was who is and will be Strong's H3068 Yahuwah 
Yod He Ua Shin Ayin Yahusha Yahusha found 216 times in the Hebrew script meaning Yahuwah's salvation Strong's H3091 Yahusha Yahusha so where do we get this idea of a European Messiah from Wisdom of Solomon chapter 14 verses 15 and 16 for a father afflicted with untimely mourning when he had made an image of his child soon taken away now honor him as a god which was then a dead man and deliver to those that were under him ceremonies and sacrifices thus in the process of time an ungodly custom grown strong was kept as a law engraving images were worshipped by the commandment of kings me who you've known as Jesus Christ and his family the Borgias Caesarea Borgia the son of Pope Alexander while having an incestuous relationship with his sister plotted against his brother Juan to obtain his office and secretly ordered him to be assassinated Juan was brutally attacked and stabbed eight times his throat cut hands tied and a stone tied about his neck to make sure he sank to the bottom of the Tiber River Pope Alexander was devastated when he heard the horrible news that Juan had been killed in his overwhelming grief he ordered an engraved image of Juan and later of Caesare to appear as Jesus Christ the Savior or San Salvador the Vatican later removed the wisdom of Solomon along with 66 other books of the Bible called the Apocrypha because it exposes the origin of Christian idolatry next Pope Alexander commissioned Leonardo Caesarea's lover to reinvent Jesus as his son Caesarea and commissioned every painting of the original Messiah to be destroyed. Don Bond was a prominent author and journalist in the U.S. and he compiled painstaking research material as it corresponded for the fellowship form. His research of the Borgia family was compiled in a volume published in 1925 called In the Pillory. The tale of the Borgia Pope and nine crowded chapters, 39 splendid illustrations. And the pillory was added to the index of prohibited books by the Vatican. It became Vatican policy to suppress any book that challenged the Catholic Christian Church. It was one of the most extreme moments of censorship in history. Many of these images of the Borgia bus have never been seen by the world. John Bond took original photos of Caesarea's image posing as Jesus Christ and compiled them in his book, In the Pillory. The photos were taken within the walls of the Vatican. Page 11. Profile of bust of San Salvatore, posed by Caesarea Borgia. Page 13. The original of this bust was found in the church of San Salvatore in Termas, now destroyed. It's an open secret that Caesarea Borgia, the son of Pope Alexander, had posed for it. Upon the demolition of the church, the bus disappeared until it was rediscovered on the walls of the penitentiary of Seville, Castellon, near Rome. Page 17. Bust of the Savior posed by Caesarea Borgia. It was removed from the Church of San Salvatore in Termas to the monumental morgue of St. Louis Church where it may be still seen and is shown by the God as the bust of the relative of a famous Pope. Page 28 Cesare, as he grew into manhood, developed a craze for seeing himself immortalized in marble and on canvas. He was possessed with the notion that he resembled the Savior. In this strange annex of the French National Church, to which I have just alluded, 
there is found a bust of the Savior, for which Cesare furnished a model. In the rare photographs still existing of this bust, one may read the legend, Bust of San Salvatore in Termis, supposed to be that of Cesare Borgia. So it was the church who commissioned the rebranding of the Messiah. And also, what you're about to find out concerning the church is that way more happened in 1492 than Columbus selling the ocean blue. Queen Isabella provided Columbus with three ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. And on August 3rd, 1492, they set sail across the unknown Atlantic. I am The ships sailed onward, but two long months after they started, there was still no sign of land ahead. Turn back, Columbus! Turn back, Columbus! We'll not turn back until we find India. Onward, men! See, not only did Rome whitewash the scriptures, but they proceeded to embark on a mission to destroy and enslave the descendants of the Hebrews starting with the tribe of Judah. The beginning of a centuries long Holocaust that started in Spain and Portugal. Well, let's see what history says about the Jews of Spain and Portugal. History states that in 70 AD after the destruction of Jerusalem, that over a million Jews fled into Africa by the way of Egypt. The rest of the Jews remained and were captured and sold as slaves throughout the Roman Empire, including Spain and Portugal, and remained there until the rise of Ferdinand and Isabella in 1492, who conquered and took Granada from the Moors, who ruled Spain since 711. After the defeat of the Moors on March 31st, Ferdinand signed the decree to expel all the Jews from Spain in the corridors of the Palace of the Great Alhambra, under the fear that they would corrupt the new Christians. Moorish and Hebrew converts and from Spain and Portugal they went to England France, Holland, Italy Turkey and the Ukraine the same lands of the Ashkenazi brothers until 1948 when Israel became a nation again in which they returned to their homeland and the nation of Israel was born the only problem with that though uh that's not what happened. This harkens back to the issue that the historians had prior to the 1900s when trying to address why the Jews were rather from black to white or white to black in certain areas. Why were they black in Africa, Israel, and India, yet white in England and Russia? For instance, Sir Richard Owen was an English biologist, comparative anatomist, and paleontologist in his own admission during the late 1800s, wrote the following in his book, Classification of Geographical Distribution of Amelia. Quote, with reference to the characteristics of color, which are extreme, we have now opportunities of knowing how much that character is the influence of climate. We know it more particularly by that most valuable mode of testing such instances, which we derive from the peculiarity of the Jewish race. For 1800 years, that race has been dispersed in different latitudes and climates. And they have preserved themselves distinct from intermixture with other races of mankind. There are still some Jews lingering in the Valley of the Jordan, having been oppressed by the successive conquerors of Syria for ages. A low race of people, and described by trustworthy travelers, as black as any of the Ethiopian races. Hold well, on, let me say that again. There are still some Jews in the Valley of the Jordan, having been oppressed by the successor of conquerors of Syria for ages. A low race of people and described by trustworthy travelers as black as any of the Ethiopian races. Others of the Jewish people participating in the European civilizations and dwelling in the northern nations show instances of light complexion 
the blue eyes, the light hair of the Scandinavian families. The condition of the Hebrews since their dispersion has not been such to admit of admixture by proselytism of household slaves. So Sir Richard Owen stated in 1859 that there was still a small number of the original Jews living in Palestine who were just as black as any of the Ethiopian races. This is 89 years, almost a century, before the Ashkenazi Jews came to Palestine in 1948. Owen stated the stark difference between the original remnant of black Jews still living in the valleys of the Jordan versus the white Scandinavian looking Jews of Europe. But when it comes to the color of the Jews of Spain and Portugal, he was never in doubt. Hence quotes like, in fact, the Spanish and Portuguese Jews, the Sephardim, who have been considered to be of a much darker complexion than the Eastern European Jews. The study of a Jews of race and environment, Maurice Frischberg, 1872. 